Well, it's good to be here with you this morning. I'm, I'm very happy that I have the opportunity to be with you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, uh, even more so as a result of coronavirus because <laughs> we've just been in our apartment basically doing nothing. Uh, I mean, I'm doing my translation work still, but having fellowship and being around like-minded believers is really a blessing for me. And so thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's great to be with you. Before we start, um, if you're having trouble reading my name and where it says, it should say translation facilitator, but somebody wrote translation advisor. If you're having trouble reading that, um, you can come forward a little bit. That's about the smallest the text will get, but this is a translation talk, so there'll be a lot of text. So you gotta make sure you'll be able to see it. So don't feel bad if you need to move forward to, to see it a little better. Um, before I start, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about my family and our work in Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is my family. Uh, my wife, Martha, three kids, Jacob, who's 15, uh, Bella, who's 13, and Asher, who is 10. And just a quick note about my wife. Last year, we went to Kingdom Fellowship Weekend, and uh, we did not grow up in the Anabaptist world. Although I will say, I may be the only true Anabaptist here. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you were baptized as an infant and then rebaptized as an adult? Okay, I got a few. So we're the true Anabaptist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But we've been, on a, we've been on a journey for the past uh, four years, my wife and I, and, uh, you know, at break I can tell you more about it, but basically uh, we've uh, felt drawn into conservative Anabaptist kingdom Christian approach to faith. And so last year we went to Kingdom Fellowship Weekend because uh, most of that time our journey was overseas in Papua New Guinea. We got back here, we're excited to be able to meet people and learn more about Anabaptists and kingdom Christian and all those sorts of things. So we went to Kingdom Fellowship Weekend. And my wife felt challenged as a result of being at Kingdom Fellowship Weekend. She said, you know what? I'm going to try head covering for 30 days and just see what happens. And she did. She did it for 30 days. And she just kept on going. And so she's been head covering every day for the, about the last year. And so that's, uh, it's been a blessing. And besides the, you know, the biblical, what the Bible says about it, she says that for her, it reminds her of who she is in Christ. And it, she says it feels like... It, it helps her to apply some of the things that, the things that we sing, where we say, Lord, I surrender all, except I'm not going to wear anything on my head, you know. No, I surrender all. What does that mean? It means you surrender all, and you give your all to Jesus. And you talk, you sing about being humble. And she said, what can be more humble than, you know, going from a lifestyle where I'm not wearing this every day to wearing it every day? So anyway, um, but it's been a blessing for her. It's been a blessing for me, and so uh, I'm very thankful for that. So that's my family. They're in Los Angeles right now. Um, we were hoping to return to the field uh, and, uh, where we work, actually this week or next week, but because of coronavirus, we've been delayed. So Papua New Guinea, in case you don't know, it's just north of Australia. Um, it's, uh, the, this side of the island is Papua New Guinea, the other side is Indonesia. And we work right, kind of right in the middle of the country, way up in the highlands. Uh, we're not in the coast. Now, when most people think of Papua New Guinea, uh, they think of things like this. If you've ever looked, you studied about Papua New Guinea or look on the internet, you're going to see things like this. Now, people only dress this way for cultural shows and political rallies. Uh, otherwise, they normally look like this. Uh, so these are what regular Papua New Guineans look like. In fact, this is the translation team that I work with. These are the six men that I work with. Um, and it's really fascinating. Uh, you know, these two gentlemen right here, Manios and Martin, They've literally gone from Stone Age to Information Age in their lifetime. Uh, you know, literally using stone axes to now they've got uh, internet on their phones. So it's, it's the change that they've seen has been remarkable. But they're, they're a wonderful team. I'm very blessed to work with them. Typical house in Papua New Guinea looks like this. Uh, this is actually the house we stayed in for five weeks when we first uh, allocated to work with the Anga people to experience life in a village without electricity or running water, and so we stayed in this house. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a bit of a challenge, but I'm glad we did it. A uh, typical village church would look like this. Again, bush materials, although more and more they are building churches that have uh, uh, like an iron roof and uh, look more Western. And they're, they're actually very happy to do that. Uh, they're not wanting to maintain churches like this. They actually want to have nicer built churches. And one of the biggest problems that we face in Papua New Guinea, uh, there's a few, but one of them is tribal fighting. And so this is a picture of a house that was burned down in, in the, one of the villages uh, of one of our translators as a result 
of tribal fighting. This is very common. These are the charred remains of a house. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that we see. So that's just a brief overview of our work in Papua New Guinea. We've been there since 2012. Um, we're actually doing a retranslation. I don't call it a revision. There was a New Testament that was translated in the late 1980s, or finished in the late 1980s. And only within a few years, the people started asking for a revision because it wasn't done well. Um, it wasn't done by Wycliffe or SIL. It was done by another mission. And so we initially started thinking that we would do a revision, but we soon realized we needed to do a retranslation. We still look at the old translation uh, in the drafting process, but I only know of one verse that we didn't introduce any changes to. Every other verse we introduce multiple changes to. And so it's important to do translation well, otherwise you know, your efforts may be wasted. Um, and so that's what we're doing. So we have actually finished drafting the New Testament, um, and we are about 60% of the way through consultant checking. And if you don't know what that is, we'll talk about that in this afternoon. Uh, before we dive in, I want to know how many people here are translators? Raise your hands. Raise them high. One, two, okay, three, a few. All right, good. So this, I hope that this session will be relevant for you whether you're a translator or not. If you are a translator, it'll, it's going to push you in some areas, and if you're not a translator, you're going to have a much greater appreciation of the difficulty of translation, and you're going to understand why you, don't, you can't do a New Testament in a year or two years. Some who are trained for translation didn't raise their hand. No, well, that's why I was wondering. It seemed like a lot of people weren't uh, doing that. Are there any experienced translators who've been on the field for a while? Sort of. Okay. I'll, get, I'll come back to you. So what are key terms? Uh, I, I think of two major categories when I think of key terms. One, and again, if you have trouble reading any of this, please feel free to move forward. Words that introduce items foreign to the culture. So right away, I think of wine, bread, sheep, camels. You know, at least in our context, these are things that are introduced. They're not traditionally within the culture, and so they don't generally have words for them. Okay, the next would be Another other category of key terms are words that communicate important theological ideas. Again, if you're working, most minority language groups throughout the world um, probably don't have a rich theological vocabulary developed. And so um, words like grace, sin, even the word for God, words like holy, which Aaron talked about earlier today, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, often there's not a pre-existing word for these concepts in a minority language group. And so that becomes a key term. You have to develop the term that you're going to use. And so that's, that, that, those are primarily what key terms are. They're ideas that are foreign to the culture or uh, objects that are foreign to the culture and they're words that communicate important theological ideas. And in both cases, the key, as I've said, the key terms often have no direct equivalent in the target language. So you've got to figure out how you're going to say this in the target language. There's no word that, it's not a matter of finding out, oh, well, how do, you, how do they say grace in this language? Oh, they don't, they don't actually have a word. Okay, we've got to think of something. So those are key terms. Now, let's do a little exercise. I want you to help me try to identify key terms from the Lord's Prayer. Just go ahead and shout them out as you think about it. Key terms from the Lord's Prayer. Words that important, uh, communicate important theological ideas or which may introduce a foreign item into the culture. Hallowed. Hallowed. Heaven. Heaven. Kingdom. Kingdom. Good. Will. will. Thy will be done. Good. Father. Father. Father is an interesting one because actually most, most cultures do have a word for father. Um, but it can be quite different. For example, in Enga, father can mean uh, the man who's married to my mother uh, through whom I came. But it can also mean any of my father's brothers. Um, brother, just to go on with that, brother can mean you know, how you and I would use the word brother. But it can also mean any male cousin who has the same uh, male ancestor. So I could use the word brother to refer to a fourth cousin if we have the same male ancestor. And I will use the word, you know, if Billy was my actual brother, not just a brother in Christ, if he was my actual brother, I would use a word for him. Um, but if, uh, you know, Priscilla, if, 
if he was your brother, you would use a different word for him because you're of an uh, opposite sex than he is. And so your word for him as brother would be different from my word. So there, are, there is some, some sense in which you need to take those into consideration, but for the most part, almost all languages have a word for, for father, I would say. That's a good guess. Any others? Bread, good. Trespasses. Trespasses. Forgive. Forgive, yeah. You're seeing pretty much every, go ahead. Sins, trespasses, yeah. Huh? Temptation. Temptation. Yeah, so you see pretty much every, every uh, word that's not like a the or and is, is a key word. The only other one I can think of that's not really a key word is the word uh, name. Uh, most cultures will have that concept of a name. All right, so you already named most of these. Hallowed, heaven, earth, kingdom, bread, forgive, trespasses, temptation. I don't think anybody said deliver or evil or power or glory or forever or amen. Those are also important <laughs> key words. But you got, uh, you got maybe half of them a little more than half. And so now we're going to have a lot of fun. I have an exercise for you. And you can work in teams, uh, small groups, uh, uh, yeah, just with people that are right around you. Try to maintain physical distancing to the extent that you can. Um, but uh, yeah, you're going to work in teams. And I want you to rewrite the Lord's Prayer in your own words in English. Okay? That's the assignment that I have for you. Rewrite the Lord's Prayer uh, in English in your own words. Does that sound pretty easy? No? Well, let me make it a little bit harder. Um, you can't use any of these words as you do it. Okay? And you also can't use any of these words. So, get into groups, and I'm going to give you 10 to 15 minutes to try to rewrite the Lord's Prayer in English without using any of these words. Now, there's about 15 words that you are going to have to try to brainstorm, and you have 10 to 15 minutes. Are you leaving that? I'll leave that up. Okay. So you, if you want to try to finish the entire Lord's Prayer, it means you can't spend more than 60 seconds on any word. All right, time's up. Time's up. I would start singing to quiet you, but I don't sing very well, so I'm just going to tell you time's up. Real, real quickly, I would like to... Um, I'd like to hear what each group came up with. Whatever you have, however raw a form it is, just uh, select a representative from your group and even if you, just read as far as you got if you didn't finish. All right, so this group here. Our Father is up above, we're here to your name, may your domain come, may your desire be done, may your love be up above. Give us our food every day, Very good. Well done. Well done. Okay, next group. Another group. Our Father who dwells in the sky, honored be your name. May your rule be established and cause what you want to happen in this world as it happens in the sky. Give us today our daily food and disregard our faults as we disregard the faults of others. Keep us from testing and from the enemy. For yours is the rule and the Majesty, eternal. Amen. Good, well done. <laughs> Except you use the word daily. Okay, next group. <laughs> Are, is this, who's next? Everybody over here is gone? Okay, over here? Go ahead. Uh, oh, go ahead, Aaron. We did the last verse, and we came up with everything is under your rule. We possess all might. All honor and praise belong to you without end. It is this way. Good. All right, uh, Jordan. Okay. Our spiritual father, we worship your name. May your reign be enlarged. May your way be established where we are as well as where you are. Provide for us the needs we have each day. Handle our wrong actions against you as we handle other people's wrong actions against us. 
keep us from the wrong way. Everything is yours, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. <laughs> well, read your first line again. Our spiritual father, we worship your name. Okay. Okay. So you had a different, different rendering for heaven in that verse than in the later verse. Okay. Next group. Well, let's, let's applaud for them, too. It's like integration, innovation, you know. <laughs> Same difference. Okay. Our Father in the sky, may your name be lifted. May your authority come. May your desire be done in land as it is in the sky. Give us the sustenance for today. Release our debt as we release those who owe us. Very good. Well done. Well done. Okay, next group. Whoever. Our Father from above, without fault is your name. May your reign come and your desire be realized here among mankind, as it is with you and your dwelling. Sustain us each day. Release us from the debt of our wrongdoing. We never release those who have wronged us. Good. Yeah. They also, so Jordan, don't feel bad because they also use different word for heaven in the two different verses. So. It's, it's, it's hard to remember that consistency when you're doing these things. Okay, next group. Our Father that lives above, let your name be honored. Let your realm come. Let that which you wish to be done be done. In our land as in your land. Give us today the food we need. Release us from what we have done wrong. As we also release others from what they have done wrong. Do not lead our thoughts. Not not let our thoughts lead us astray, but keep us from the enemy. For you rule everywhere with all strength always. Amen. Good. You see, you see how hard it is to be consistent with key terms with, with heaven. All right? Our Father from above, let your name be honored. Come as king, do what you want where we live as it is where you live. Give us our food every day and let go of our crimes as we let go of what people do us. And do not lead us into a trap, but cut us loose from that. We didn't get the last verse done, so we'll paste errors. Okay, good, good. Well done. <laughs> so was this easy or hard? Hard, hard? hard. And you know what you have going for you? You already speak English. And English is a language that's full of synonyms. So it's very easy to come up with other ways to say the same thing. That's not true in a lot of other languages. A lot of other languages do not have rich synonyms like English does. And so imagine trying to do this in a language that is very, uh, hasn't been studied by outsiders at all, um, very poorly documented, and you're trying to work through this. You start to see why it takes so long to do translation work. This is just four short verses. Right? But I even in these four short verses, we have about 15 important key terms. And you saw how difficult it was to, I'd say about half the groups translated heaven differently in verse 9 than they did a, a little farther down. Uh, and that's a true with key terms. It's very hard to maintain consistency when you're, when you're translating um, because what works in one situation, it may be hard to work in another situation. And to try to figure out how to make those as consistent as possible is, is a real challenge. So, um, so this is how we did it in Enga. We didn't use any of those words either. But this is how the Enga translation sounds. Our Father who stands on top of the sky, tell us to speak well of your name. Tell your ruling domain to come. On top of the sky, they act according to your thinking. Tell us to do that also in this down below land. Give us the food for eating today. We are canceling the debts of those who do bad against us, so you cancel the debts of our bads. Do not lead us and go into the trials that happen, which tell us to do bad. Take action and get us from the hand of the bad man. The ruling domain and the strength and the light, they are obviously even yours, later and later, very true. And so it's a real challenge when you start taking away what you know in English, what you've always known as the key terms, and you have to think of another way to say it. But that's what translation is all about. What is this word that I've said all my life what does it actually mean? And how do I communicate that in another language? So we're going to talk about that. Strategies for translating key terms. Like I said, you have to discover the actual meaning or meanings of a word. 
We have all these, this religious terminology that we use, holy, holy, holy. What does that actually mean? And how can I put that into another language? So how do we discover the actual meanings of words? There's some great lexicons. This is one of the primary ways, great lexicons that we can use. The one that I use quite frequently because it's embedded in Paratext, which for those of you who don't know, Paratext is the Bible translation software that I think uh, ABT is using, is that right? Um, so one is the analytical lexicon of the Greek New Testament. I use this all the time. I'll give you, uh, uh, in a second we'll come to that. So that's uh, Koine Greek, that's uh, the Greek New Testament time period. Another one that I like to use is called LSJ. Has anybody heard of LSJ? It's, it's actually a dictionary of classical Greek. LSJ stands for Liddell Scott Jones, and it's a dictionary of classical Greek. It exists in three different forms. One is a small version, and because one of the guy's uh, names is Liddell or Little, I'm not sure how to say it, but they call the small one, they call it the Little Little. And then they have a medium-sized one that they call the Middle Little. And then they have a large one that they call the Big Little, or they call it the Great Scott after one of the other guys. <laughs> So that's a uh, dictionary of classical Greek. Now, classical Greek is not always the same as New Testament Greek, but sometimes it gives you insight into non-religious sounding definitions of words. Another one is BDAG, which is the acronym of the four editors who have worked on it. Uh, this is by far like the most well-respected lexicon of the Greek New Testament and early Christian literature, but it's expensive. It'll run you over $100, um, if, if not 135 and then there is Danker's Concise Greek English Lexicon. Danker is the D from BDAG, and uh, this is less expensive, but really uh, quite helpful. So these are the, the four lexicons that I tend to use. There's other good ones out there, too. Um, and we'll take a, just a quick look at some of those. Um, other, another thing to look at is uh, Septuagint, when you're doing uh, the Greek New Testament. By the way, Emmanuel, I'm sorry, uh, most of this is going to be focused on Greek. Um, that's what I'm more familiar with, and I think most of the people training here are actually training in Greek, uh, so that worked out well, but a lot of this will apply to Hebrew as well, uh, just different lexicons. But if you look at the Septuagint, that helps you with some definitions. Can anybody read Hebrews 9.4 uh, in their translation that they have, King James, New King James? Anybody have that handy? When you have it, just go ahead and read it. which have the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. So it's talking, it's describing the Holy of Holies, and it says that it has, in the King James, New King James, it says the golden censer. Censer is a dish that you use to um, carry the incense to create the smoke. Um, and most... Other translations, modern translations, ESV, NIV, such like that, uh, they don't say censer, they say the um, altar of incense. Now, if you think about it, it's describing the Holy of Holies. Does anybody, your geography of the holy place fairly clear? Do you know where the altar of incense is? Is it inside the Holy of Holies or is it outside the Holy of Holies? It's outside. And so, by translating it as altar of incense, you're making it seem like the writer of Hebrews doesn't understand where the altar of incense is. So who's right? Is it the altar of incense or is it, the gold, is it a censer? Which there was a golden censer within the Holy of Holies. Well, you go look at the Septuagint and you see that every time that this Greek word, thymiotherion, is used, it represents, it's translating censer and not the altar of incense. And so the Septuagint can give you a lot of help um, to figure out what the Greek words uh, mean. Especially when you're reading a book like Hebrews, which draws heavily from the Septuagint. So it's another source for understanding key terms. All right, I mentioned this during our last activity, but we want to avoid religious terminology. As we're trying to come up with what things mean, avoid religious terminology, because religious terminology doesn't usually communicate meaning to us. It's words that we know and we say all the time, but it's sort of devoid of meaning. So as you're trying to translate key terms, avoid thinking in terms of religious terminology. And also ask yourself, what categories of words is this particular word used with? Is it used with nouns? Is it used with people? Is it used with actions? Because the word you choose might vary. Uh, the translation you choose might vary depending on those things. So let's look at this word. Who, who can read uh, capital letter Greek and tell me what that word is? Agios. Agios. That's right. So uh, don't tell me what it means. 
Uh, we're going to just take a look at that word, agios, agios. Okay, first we're going to look at the analytical lexicon of the Greek New Testament. I know it's a bit small. This is the lexicon that's embedded in paratext. And uh, I'm just going to read some of the definitions. What I like about this lexicon is that it often gives non-religious definitions of words. It has religious uh, words too, but it says, as the state of persons or things that are closely related to or belong to God. Okay, that's regular English. That's not religious terminology. Then it says holy. Okay, that's religious terminology. Of things set apart for God's purpose. Dedicated. Well, that's helpful. That's plain English. Then it says sacred and holy. That sounds religious to me. Okay, it's the opposite of kinos, which means not consecrated or common. Uh, it can mean holy thing. What is holy? Those sound religious. What is dedicated to God? Okay, that sounds like regular English. As a place dedicated to God, regular English, sanctuary, holy place, religious terminology. Okay, uh, we'll move down a little bit. Let's see. Of persons committed to a close relationship with God. Oh, that's helpful. Uh, human beings dedicated to God. Of a greeting expressing fellowship with a co in a community of people devoted to God. Holy kiss. Uh, it can also mean, uh, let's see, Insti re regarding institutions such as law, covenant. It's referring to things that originate from God and have his authority. And so when you look at the lexicon, you're trying to find those words that don't sound religious, um, that help you understand what the word actually means. If you were to ask most Christians in America what holy means, they probably wouldn't be able to tell you. Okay. So here's, here's some of the things that we gleaned from that entry. What does agios mean? Closely related to God. Belonging to God. Originating from God and having his authority. Set apart for God. Dedicated, devoted to God. So those are all regular words that help us to understand what this word agios means. Okay, and now what sort of categories of words is it used with in the Bible, in the New Testament? It's used with things. Writings are called holy. Ground is called holy. Root is called holy. Abstract concepts, covenant, commandment, conduct, faith. Those are called, all those things are called holy in the New Testament. Or hagios, I should say. People. Saints. Saints is actually just the Greek word, agios. It's the same word. Prophets, apostles, brothers, women, they're all called holy in the New Testament. Places, city, temple, holy place, most holy place. Again, they're all described with this Greek word. Actions, a kiss, is described as holy or agios. Divine beings are described as holy or agios. Angels, God, spirit. Okay, so, so after I look it up in that one lexicon, I'm now going to the LSJ, uh, this is the Great Scott, or the Big Little. And it's, it's pretty small, so I'll just read it for you. Again, I, I, used, I go here to kind of confirm what I've found out. Okay, devoted to the gods. All right, that makes sense. Devoted to the gods. Now, this is coming from classical Greek, so it says gods. Something devoted to the gods, not God. Uh, sacred, holy, again, those words I don't find very helpful. But it also says of persons, holy or pure. Okay, pure is helpful for me to understand what this word can mean. And then it, ha it says, in a bad sense, accursed or execrable. Okay, that's not really used that way in the New Testament at all, so I kind of ignore that. So after I look at, that's the, that's the, uh, um, the great Scott or the big little. If you want an easier one, you can look at the middle little. The middle little has all the same information, but it's just shorter. So you get the same information, just condensed. So I go back to my understanding of agios, and what have I learned from looking at the LSJ? It can also mean pure. So I've now filled out my understanding of agios without using any religious terminology, and I feel uh, more equipped to now communicate this to the translation team that I work with. Before we go on, just to give you a quick look, I know you won't be able to read this, uh, but this is the BDAG. This is the most respected lexicon of uh, New Testament Greek, BDAG stands for Bauer, Danker, Arndt, and Gingrich. 
And what's helpful about this particular lexicon, I know you can't see it very well, but it pretty much lists every occurrence in the New Testament with the reference. And so if you're struggling to know which particular meaning of a word is intended in a particular verse, you can go to this lexicon and it'll tell you, you know, in, um, you know, in John 5, 6, the word has this meaning, or so the editors think. So that's a real helpful tool. Again, this one is really expensive though. And then the same editor also did this version, a concise uh, version of what we just looked at. Also very helpful. Uh, again, it's hard to see, but he also lists not all, but many of the references. So we won't spend time on those. I know they're hard to see. All right, so we talked about as we're translating key terms that we need to discover the actual meaning of the word. We look at those lexicons. We want to avoid religious terminology and we want to look at the categories of words that it is used with. All right? Now let's talk about com communicating to the mother tongue translators that you're working with because we are facilitators, right? We're not doing the work. We are facilitating others to do the work, which is how it should be. So how do we communicate these ideas to mother tongue translators? Again, re avoid religious terminology. Uh, if you're talking with your team and you're using words like holy, sanctified, consecrated, hallowed, saint, it's not, probably not communicating anything to them. Or whatever the equivalent religious terminology is in Spanish or French or, or Portuguese or whatever, whatever the language of wider communication is, they probably have their own religious terminology. And it's likely that the translators you're working with don't understand that religious terminology. Try to find culturally relevant parallels. All right, I'll give you a few examples here. Um, in Enga, they have a certain type of axe called a wa gayam that's only used for ceremonial purposes. You know, most of the axes they use every day, but they have this certain axe, it's, it's an older stone axe, and they only use it during ceremonies. And so as I'm trying to explain what holy means, I say to the team, I say, you know, you know that axe that you use for religious ceremonies, do you use that, you know, just when you want to chop down a tree, do you go and grab that and use it? No, 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 we, we only use it for those purposes. I said, that axe is holy. It is set apart for a specific designated use. And if you were to use it for something else, it would be, uh, it would diminish the value of it. And so it's set apart for that use. I was with my parents a couple days ago and I was just telling them a little bit about what I'd share with you and I asked them what does holy mean and they, you know, they, they're professing Christians but they couldn't tell me what holy meant. And so I said, well come into the dining room. We went into the dining room and I pulled out a drawer where I knew they had special silverware that they only use on special occasions. I said, tell me about this silverware. And it took them a while but, you know, we only use that on special occasions. I said, this silverware is holy. It is set apart. It's not for common use. It is for specific purposes. Uh, that you use this silverware. Now when you start talking like that, in culturally relevant ways, it starts to click with the translators. Oh, when we talk about being, something being holy, it's like that axe that we only use on special occasions. Okay? Taboo house. We had a hard time translating temple. There's actually two words for temple. One refers to the temple grounds, one refers to the actual building. That's another point, but good for you translators to be aware of that trying to translate the word temple, and for a long time we were saying uh, the big worship house, the big worship house. And I started feeling uneasy with that. And so finally I asked my translators, I said, what do you think people do in the big worship house? Well, they pray and they sing songs, they listen to a sermon, thinking, okay, we've got, we've got the wrong idea here. Because they think it's like a church building where you go and do those sorts of things. But when we're talking about the temple, particularly the, the house of the temple, the actual what in Greek is called naos, the actual building of the temple where the Holy of Holies is. It's not a public meeting place, right? No, there's only certain people allowed in there and only for certain purposes. It's set apart for those particular purposes. In that sense, it is holy. And so once I explained that, we were able to come up, oh, oh, okay. It's not where people go to worship on Sunday. No, no, no. It's a very s specific use. They call it in... in uh, in Tokpizan, which is the trade language, they call it taboo house. Taboo. Um, and of course, a taboo is something that you sort of avoid, right? You don't do something that's taboo. All right, another way to communicate is to act it out. This carries a lot more weight than words. 
So I, mean, I need a couple of volunteers. We'll take Luke. Okay, I need a couple people to imprison Luke over there. Come on, take him and, yeah, Jordan, go imprison him over there. All right, Bryant and Riley, come over here. All right, so you want to get him back, right? And the only way they're going to give him back to you, Bryant, is if you give Riley an exchange. So I want you to take him over there and go exchange him. Uh, because really, Luke, we want him more than we want Riley, so go ahead and exchange them. <laughs> All right. So when, when I did that sort of demonstration with the translation team, oh, now we understand what ransom is, you know. We get a much clearer picture of what it means to ransom someone. Or you could even, I think I had them do it with a pig, you know, just to get the idea. When your enemies take somebody from your tribe, what do you do to get that person back? Can you, know, can you go give them a pig and they'll release? Yeah, we can do that. So, okay, go ahead and do it and act it out. So when they act it out, they have a much better understanding. They see it happening. And a lot of um, cultures around the world, they're a lot more visual. Um, and, if so, and even for us, too, here. If you act something out, the meaning becomes more clear. Give concrete examples. If you want to talk about what it means to be pure, go get a glass of water from the river, put it on a table, and then get a glass of water from, uh, you know, maybe a bottle of water, put it on the table, and say, what's the difference between these? Oh, well, this one has dirt mixed in. This one doesn't have any dirt mixed in. Okay, this one's pure. This one's not pure. And they see it. When they can see it, it becomes more clear, the meaning. Pictures. Pictures are great. Try to explain a wine press to people who have never even heard of the term wine and have never seen a grape. You can spend three hours trying to explain it, and it's just not going, you're not going to accomplish much. All right? But when you show them this picture, they start to understand. Oh, so they put all this, I mean, they have an idea, you know, put all this fruit, whatever it may be, this grapefruit. Well, it's not grapefruit. Fruit, that is grapes. Put it in that big, that big area up there, then you have people stomp on it. Juice comes out, and it goes into these vats, and that's how you make wine. Okay, now, now we understand. So they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and that is definitely true. So as much as you can show pictures to explain concepts, that's really helpful. Or like Solomon's colonnade, colonnade, uh, colonnade I'm not sure how to say it. Um, you show a picture of it, you're going to save yourself a whole lot of time uh, than if you try to explain it with words. All right. Now I'm going to come back to something Billy said yesterday, but it doesn't have the same potential uh, effects. Trust the instincts of native speakers. Yesterday, remember he was talking about the honey and they were eating, what, what do you call the other stuff? Propolis. propolis? They're eating the propolis, whatever that is. Maybe you had a picture, I don't understand. <laughs> um, they were eating that and it had some hallucinogenic properties in it which they experienced the effects of. So they said, we learned that we need to trust the local people. And I'm saying, trust the instincts of native speakers. We had an interesting, interesting discussion trying to come up with a key term for lake of fire. Lake of fire. Now, they have a word for lake, and it's a combination of two words. It's a combination of the word depression, and I'm not talking about where you're feeling sad. I'm talking about a depression in the ground. It's the word depression with the word water. So a lake is a water depression. Make sense? It's water filling up a part of the land that has, has a depression. So I said, all right, well, then let's just say fire depression. You know, fire depression, you know, the depression in the ground that's filled with fire instead of water. And I was kind of strong on that. I'm like, yeah, no, that's, that's what we should do because it's a lake. You know, that's how you say the lake normally. So let's just switch out the water with fire, you know, <laughs> solved. And they were kind of uneasy, and I could tell they weren't fully on board. I was pushing it too hard, and I just got the sense of something's not right. And a lot of times, you can get the sense that something is wrong, but you can't explain why. It's like, that doesn't sound right. I can't really explain why. It doesn't sound right. And, uh, you know, when we think of Lake of Fire, we think of this, right? It's sort of the image that you'd be, you know, big place, fire everywhere, you know, place you don't want to go. And so I'm, this is what I'm picturing when I'm saying fire depression. And finally, it dawns on our senior translator. He says, he says you know, that word you're saying, you know what that is? You know what that is? 
And uh, instead of this horrific place, um, what I was suggesting that we translate for lake of fire was this. <laughs> that, is, that is a uh, fire depression. It's a dugout area in the ground where you have fire. And so certainly I wouldn't want to be thrown in there, but it doesn't quite have the same impact as this. And so I learned I need to trust my, the local translators that I work with because there's things that they're going to grab hold of that I'm going to miss. And so that's an important lesson, Billy. I think you and I have both learned. All right, so we're talking about strategies for translating key terms, um, avoid religious terminology, find culturally relevant parallels, act it out, use concrete examples, use pictures, trust the insects, instec insects, instincts of nat native speakers and integration. Right, don't forget about integration and segregation. <laughs> The last one is patience and repetition. The last one is patience and repetition. The last one is patience and repetition. <laughs> I've had to tell the translation team that I work with, when they're on the wrong track with the meaning of a word, I've had to tell them 10, 20 times until they start to realize our conception is wrong. Uh, so you just have to be very patient, you have to keep repeating it, especially in Papua New Guinean culture where anything that's important you have to repeat five times anyway. So for an Enga, the default concept that they were working on for holy, or hagios, was very good. Very good. Uh, it's a very good, he's a very good person, so he's holy. And there's maybe a little bit of crossover there, but it's really kind of missing the point. And so I'm going to tell you what we came up with for the various categories. For place, what we came up was, uh, with was forbidden access. It's a forbidden access place, meaning there's only a few people that have access to that place. And if you think about what, a, what the temple is, that's very true. Only a few people have access to it. For a person, we said that it is the person is designated as gods, designated as belonging to God, set aside, set apart as gods. For a thing, we described it as something belonging to God. The Holy Scriptures are God's scriptures, God's writings. Divine being, for Holy Spirit, we really went wild and we said, Holy Spirit. Because everybody was, always say, everybody was already saying Holy Spirit for Holy Spirit. They just borrowed the term. And so we just went with that. For God, we talk about God being holy, well, you can't talk about God belonging to God. You can't talk about God being designated as God's or as belonging to God. So we had to say, God, describe God as someone who has no bad upon him. In that sense, he's set apart. He's not set apart for God. He's set apart from evil. And so in that sense, he's set apart. And then for the holy kiss, we said, kiss doing as people designated as belonging to God do. So we described the people as holy, and we said, when the people who are holy kiss, that's the holy kiss. So kissing in a way that people who are designated as God, as belonging to God, do. Now this was the most difficult for the term agios, the most difficult verse we had. Be ye holy, for I am holy. So I just told you that for people, we said you're holy when you're designated as belonging to God. But that we can't say that for God. So here we have to describe... God is holy, and people is holy. So it was a real challenge. So finally, we came up with this. This is God speaking. A bad is not upon me. With reference to that, live avoiding bad things so that a bad may not be upon you. And that's not consistent with how we translated um, holy or saints in other places, but it was the only way it would work. So sometimes you can't, you, you have to put aside consistency for the sake of uh, getting the translation right. All right, some miscellaneous points. Some key terms, like Holy Spirit in Enga that they just borrowed, some may already be established. They may already have a word for God and everybody's happy using it, and it's you know, good enough, leave it alone. Just let them keep using it. If it's completely wrong, you probably need to change it. But if it's good enough, it's getting most of the idea across and it's already being widely used, uh, you're gonna have trouble changing it. So be, realize that. 
Uh, key terms must be acceptable to the community. You may come up with a great key term, but if nobody likes it, they're not going to use it. I think of the word Jehovah in the history of English translation. Uh, you know, the English Revised Version and the American Standard Version, and even the Christian Standard Bible, or I guess at the time it was Holman Christian Standard, they have tried to use the word Jehovah for Yahweh. And in each case, um, subsequent translations dropped it because people just don't like it. People don't, in, I mean, some people do, but the vast majority of people do not accept Jehovah in place of the Lord. They like the, the, how the Lord sounds, and they don't want you messing with it. And that's important. If people are not going to accept your translation, and they're not going to use it. And so you have to be sensitive to that. Like I said, it's okay to borrow key terms. I think about it in English, you know, we're going to have Mexican food tonight. Can you stop at the store and get some tortillas? Does it, do any of you say, can you stop at the store and get some thin, flat flour pancakes? <laughs> no, you, all, you just say tortillas. It's not an English word. It's a borrowed word. But we all use it. And we all know what it means, and it's acceptable. And in the languages where you work, you're certainly going to find words like that, where it's borrowed, but everybody uses it. Everybody knows what it means. Go ahead and use it. It's fine. Don't feel like you have to be a purist uh, using only words that originate out of that language. We once had a pastor criticizing our translation. And speaking in the Anglo language, he said he was denouncing it because we didn't use, and he said, this is exactly what he said, we didn't use pure Anga. So in denouncing us, <laughs> in denouncing us for using borrowed terms, he actually said pure Anga. We're, you're not using pure Anga. I don't think he saw the uh, contradiction there. But don't feel like you have to be completely pure in using only the, talk, uh, the language uh, where you're working. Try to avoid inserting foreign objects into biblical culture. So give us a stay our daily bread. I told you you couldn't use bread, and you said food. That's fine. Every culture has food. They understand that. But I would hesitate to say give us a stay our daily sweet potato because that's, th th then people think, oh, the Israelites ate sweet potatoes just like we do. Oh, no, they didn't. Um, so avoid that. Uh, rather than using a specific term, go to a more general term. Another example would be uh, where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break into steel. Okay, in their mind, moths don't destroy clothes. So they wanted to say cockroach. And I said, well, I, don't, I didn't like that. I said, that's not what it says. That it's, it says moths. So let's just use the general term insects. Okay, that's more acceptable. Everybody has insects. Everybody knows what that is. So it's, in my opinion, it's more acceptable to go general than it is to substitute a specific item for another specific item if that, the item you're substituting doesn't really exist in Israeli culture. I'm sure Israelis had, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the Israelites had um, cockroaches too, but it's just not what it says in that verse. Developing key terms takes time. Uh, you're probably going to have to be patient yourself and be ready to change your terms when you realize that what you're using isn't the best term. And that's the next point. Expect your key terms to change as you grow as a team. And then find, find key terms in everyday life. And this is especially where those of you who are doing community development or literacy, not directly involved in translation, you can really help your translation team this way. What do I mean by that? Find key terms in everyday life. Let's talk about yoke. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you, right? What is a yoke? It literally, um, uh, zigos means crossbeam or crossbar. That's all it means. Okay, so we're trying to figure out this term in Enga where we don't have any beasts of burden. <laughs> Normally we understand a yoke as a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the necks of two animals and attached to the plow or cart that they are to pull. So we think of something like this, right? This is a yoke. Now, again, we don't have beasts of burden in Enga, in Papua New Guinea, so nobody, this means nothing to anybody there. But what, what can a yoke also mean? Another definition of yoke is a frame fitting over the neck and shoulders of a person used for carrying pails or baskets. Now let's play the Mennonite game. Does anybody know who this is? 50 points. <laughs> I don't know who it is either. I just thought maybe somebody might know. <laughs> So this is also a yoke. It's a single person yoke used to, to help distribute the weight to make it easier to carry the two buckets. 
OK, so I started thinking about that. Oh, it's not just for animals, it would be for a person. And then one day, I'm, I'm just out, I'm hiking around with my family, and I see somebody walk by. And I'd seen this before, but it struck me this time. I see somebody walk by like this. And he's carrying this huge piece of wood, huge log. But what's he have in his left hand? I saw, I saw him walking by. What they do is they, they use this stick to help balance the weight, to make it easier to carry. And, I, and it dawned on me, I'm like, this is our term. I said, what is that called? What's that stick called? And they said, oh, that's a piaquen. OK. We've got to use that. All right, so then we translated Matthew 11, 29 to 30. This was months, if not years, after we had already finished this. I was never happy with our translation. And so we came up with this. I am a soft man who stands down below. Learn from me and take my piaquen. That stick. Take my piaquend in order to take away and remove heaviness from your shoulders. Once you have taken it, you will receive rest. As my piaquend helps, whatever I give you to carry is not heavy, and you will carry it without feeling heaviness. That's the closest cultural parallel that we could come up with. It's not perfect. Translation is an exercise in constant frustration, because you can never find perfect parallels. But it was the closest we could get. But I, we never would have thought of that in, unless I was out in the culture and I saw that person walking and it dawned on me. So as you're doing community development literacy, you can also have those insights and help your translation team. Real quick, uh, we're out of time, but I'll just go over, just for interest, other key terms in anger. Grace, help by means of felt pity. Save, take action and get. So you see somebody about to fall off a cliff, you take action and you go get them. You save them. All right? Bless, cause goodness or happiness to happen to. Christ, Christ. We just borrowed that because the explanation is too long. In Tokpizen, the, the trade language where we live, they tried to explain this in some of the contexts, and this is what, how they translated Christ. Yeah, you won't understand what I'm saying, but tell me if you think it's a good translation. Man gori ben makin blog kizim bag on man meri blogen. The the man that God designated to get back all the people that belong to him. Okay, that's just too long. It's just too long. It's a, a whole sentence to translate one word. And we said, you know what, we're just going to say Christ, and we're going to leave it to the pastors to explain what that means. This is where you have to balance uh, the work of translation and the work of teaching. Uh, my rule of thumb is that translation is translation, Bible teaching is Bible teaching, and they shouldn't be mixed. Um, when you start mixing them, you don't do either one of them very well. Now, you could say anointed one. That would be a shorter uh, way to say it. But that might not portray the right meaning in some languages. Okay, swear or oath is say the name of something to strengthen speech. Glorify, give big name to or lift up. Heal, cause sickness to become nothing. Temple, we already talked about this, God's forbidden access house. Hypocrite, person who makes an appearance of following God. Idol, something made and called a God. Mediator, man who takes and joins together saying that they should be as one. Gentiles, other man tribes. Hades, place where dead people are. It's important to distinguish between Hades and hell, or Gehenna, when you're translating. Uh, King James did not do that, and it's caused all sorts of confusion. Parable, sign word. Persecute, give pain and cause to be harmed. And that pain can be literal or it can be uh, sort of figurative. Repent, turn heart. Synagogue, worship house of the Jews. Throne, king sitting platform. All right. Um, should I stop there, or should I do one more story, Joel, or Brian, Aaron, whoever? All right, let's just talk briefly about the beast of Revelation, uh, Therion. This was a struggle for us. As we were doing the book of translation, uh, different chapters were assigned to different translators, and then as we were going through it, I saw that some, one translator had translated it as wild pig, and another translator had translated it as wild dog. 
is we had to figure out, is the beast a wild pig or a wild dog? You see, in, in Enga, there's no generic word for animal. They don't have that. And that'd be true in a lot of languages. They don't have general cate categorical words like we do in English. They have four main types of animals. They have pig-type animals, which have hooves and are generally herbivores, but a wild pig uh, can do some damage to a person. They have dog-type animals, which have claws and are predators. They have opossum-type animals, which are marsupials, tree kangaroos. And they have bird-type animals, and I don't need to explain that. So which do we choose? Well, like I said, they had said, some, one had said uh, wild pig, one had said wild dog. What does Revelation 13, 2 say? Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The, dra the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So which one is it? That's right. I was very happy to realize that the beast is a wild dog. You, we wouldn't think of a lion or a bear as being, maybe a bear, but a lion as being a dog, right? It's just, we have different categories for animals. But it perfectly fit all three of those, lion, uh, bear, leopard, they all fell, fell perfectly within the dog category of animals. So the beast is a wild dog. 